much. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be standing. You're not just little squares on a screen, or even worse, just a little green dot at the top of the screen. Real people, flesh and blood. Oh, this is wonderful. I'm quite overwhelmed by it all. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, yeah, it doesn't say there that I'm a Devon boy, but North Devon. <laughs> Born and bred in Barnstable. This, you know, coming down here, this really feels like a foreign venture. <laughs> I'm prepared to tolerate your sea, which is actually rather lovely this evening. <laughs> so, um, but I've always loved Sydney. I absolutely adore it. Um, I was just telling Dave, I'm a regular at the Beautiful Days Festival at the road because I'm a big fan of the levers. So, um, and then uh, that's the last time I came down to Sydney. And uh, I mean, so I jumped at the chance coming down here. Just, just wonderful. Okay, so I'm going to go on for a bit. And I think if I was online, I would talk for you know 25 minutes probably maximum because that's as much as you can do. But I think uh, you know you'll come here and make the effort. So I'm going to talk a little bit longer maybe about 40 minutes, and then I want to make sure lots of time for questions. So save up your questions. Anything about sort of numbers and COVID, I'll have a go at answering. And then I'm extremely happy to flog a few books, and well, they're flogging the books, to sign any books at the back. Um, okay, so that's me. Um, yeah, 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 all that stuff. Um, but this is, this is interesting. Last April, I was appointed as a non-executive director of the UK Statistics Authority. Non-executive director, that's the sort of post that Matt Hancock's girlfriend has. <laughs> <laughs> no, so far, no one's fondled my bottom, which I think I'm deeply disappointed about this. And behind the photocopier. So, this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> so, but this means that uh, this is the one that oversees the whole of national statistics, the, the census, the office of national statistics. So when I say wonderful things about national statistics, you know, I have, I'm, I am biased, so I, there's a conflict of interest we've got there. Um, so me, um, I used to do sort of difficult sums, you know, I used to work in probability and AI and uh, Bayesian clinical trials and Bayesian analysis and complex and modeling and things like that. So I used to do that kind of academic stuff with PhD students. I started, I, used to, I, I did start off as a mathematician, but terribly second rate, so I wasn't very good in the to give that up, but I enjoyed doing stats. But then I was really lucky in 2007, because I was getting a bit bored with this academic stuff, you know, um, to get funding from a philanthropist, David Harding, hedge fund manager, billionaire. Can I recommend finding a billionaire friend <laughs> who likes to give money out? I, it's very useful indeed. So since then, he's supported, he supported me to change my job into this professor for the public understanding of the risk. Formerly, I've retired from that post now, but I'm still doing it anyway, unpaid. And, and that enabled me to go on to do climate change programs, how to fry. Um, I was working with Hero Town, change my numbers, tells you when. So, it's really, you know, BBC4 documentaries, the kind of standard stuff that, um, you know, I suppose I was trying to be a sort of, you know, bargain basement for Iron Cox or something like that. Anyway, it was fun. It was great <laughs> doing that. And, you know, then the whole Nanon policy, and then, but I did get, you know, essentially, Developing a lot of media presence and knowing journalists and things like that. And then COVID came along, and you know, that's been very useful. But now, actually, that's not a picture, we've got about 14 of us now in this team, the Winston Center for Risk and Evidence Communication. It's a clumsy title, we couldn't think of anything else to call it. And th these are psychologists and web designers and community ex BBC people, all working on communication. And that, so that's what all I work on now. I don't do the data analysis. I just talk about communicating numbers. And I'll, I'll, I'll point out some of our work later, which you may have seen, um, and it will be incredibly busy. Oh, it's all on risk perceptions, people's feelings about COVID and so on. Anyway, um, book, that's for sale at the back as well. I mean, honestly, what's the book? I'm not going to come all the way down here and not try to flog a few books. You know? <laughs> yeah. Sold very well. Nothing like a pandemic for selling popular statistics books. <laughs> you know, never look a gift pandemic. And, so, um, and then this one came out last week, and that seems to be doing quite well as well. And I'm going to be talking about some of the stuff in there. Okay, so this is the sort of stuff that we see all the time. This is Dash. I was going, oh, that must be updated. This was from a few days ago. Anyway, it hasn't changed that much because we're sort of toddling. Uh, people could ask me later about where, where we think where you think we are and what's going to happen. I don't know. So I must as well say no, what I'm going to say. But it, we've been sort of toddling along. Um, and uh, you know, uh, cases have been going up, and vaccinations are actually not 
progressing very well and so on. But the point is that we get these daily numbers, four o'clock every day, this is updated, it's on the news. We just hear these numbers all the time. So can we believe these numbers? Here's some numbers I think we can believe more than most, but even these are not completely reliable. Now I would say this one though, this is the Office for National Statistics. They've been doing weekly announcements of death registration since about 1845, and no one's ever taken the slightest bit of notice of it <laughs> until this pandemic came along. And suddenly on Tuesdays at 9.30 in the morning, everyone's refreshing their screen to find out the latest thing that ONS has been saying. So this is one of the main graphics. I can give a whole talk on this graphic, but basically this is the kind of story so far, at least in terms of death. So you know, this is the period, this is, here we got the first wave, um, a huge spike, unprecedented double. The black line, I hope you can see it, is the normal number of deaths. The, it jumps up and down a lot because this is registra registrations. And if the registry office is closed because of a bank holiday, there's a big dip, it's pure heart attack. Jumps up and down. You can see the basics in the line. Huge spike, double the normal number of deaths. And then this is not, um, you know, this is real. But look at this excess, non, sorry, the blue are the COVID deaths. With COVID on the deaths. Yeah. We'll come on to whether it's with COVID or because of COVID later. But the green are non COVID deaths. This is the normal old stuff people die. Look at that huge excess non COVID deaths in the first wave. These were COVID deaths. They, these were um, largely people in care homes. There's special dispensation that the doctor didn't have to see. The, um, and, and first of all, I may say, I've got to apologize. I've had friends and relations who died of COVID. I may sound a bit cold in talking through this data. It does not mean, I assure you, that I don't have a feeling for the enormous suffering many of you will have had relations who have suffered in life, I'm sure, and, and possibly other people in care. Homes. So if I sound a bit abrupt, I do apologize, but that's not because of, I hope, a lack of sensitivity. It's because, you know, I'm a statistician and we look at this stuff all the time. So anyway, the uh, doctors did not have to see the patients to sign the death certificates. No one was being tested at the time. It was a huge disaster, which has obviously just been revealed again this week. And so they were some were reluctant to put COVID on the death certificates, even though these were almost certainly COVID deaths. Then what happened in the second wave, last one, so you get a huge spike, huge number of COVID deaths. Now we've got a deficit of non-COVID deaths. Far fewer non-COVID deaths than normal. So what's going on there? Lots of reasons. First thing is no flu. So 10 to 20,000 lives were saved last winter because we were all going around with masks and keeping our distance very close. No flu. Now, what it means about this winter, uh, I've had my jab already. I've never had a flu jab before in my life. I've had it already because who knows what's going to happen this winter. We have you know, the lack of immunity in the population. Is huge uncertainty about what's going to happen. So that was, um, you know, so there's flu deaths that were saved there, but also, sadly, many people who, you know, who died there, many, some, still not quite sure how many, probably not that, I always said about 5 to 15% of the people who died there would have died the following winter. In other words, their deaths have been brought forward. What's known, they're very frail people in care homes or whatever who, who died of. You know, lost maybe a year of life or so many months of life. And um, this is known as mortality displacement. There's a whole analysis by ONS just came out today about mortality displacement. Um, it's also known by this appalling term, harvesting. Now that's the, that's the, if you Google it and Wikipedia, that is the name given by the epidemiological profession for when deaths are brought forward because of cold or something like that, harvesting. Nobody, it's been acknowledged this is not a sensitive so mortality displacement is a bit So a lot of displacement, and then, then you can see big mortality displacement here, the people dying here, then the deaths were below average, all through, all through May, June, and so on, so huge, the below average, that's because some old people had died early. So a big deficit. So um, now we're toddling along, um, you know, yeah, it looks like non-COVID deaths. It looks there as if they're in excess. In fact, the actuaries say if you allow the changes in the population, there's no excess non-COVID deaths, which in a sense is a relief so far because when and if, the big question is, are we going to see the effect of the enormous disruption of care? 
in our space. They've delayed cancer uh, appointments, delayed operations. What are the downstream effects going to be? Are we going to play out over months and years? When are we going to start seeing these seriously? That's the issue. Okay, now, then we're going to dig down. Okay, that's all right, but what else can we see? Now, this graph, we get a whole story about this graph. Uh, this is about where people have died. And I, it, it, I don't think there's been enough attention to the fact that there's been a systematic change in this country about where people have died. People have died at home. A third more than used to die at home. So for every three people who used to die at home, there are four people who die at home. And that's, that's right throughout the whole pandemic. Again, many of you may have had experiences of this. Um, that, and it has nothing to do with how active the virus is. Very few of these are COVID deaths. It's just that people are not going to hospital to die in the way that they do. Now these are, um, if you look at Scottish data, you can see that these are very large uh, cancer, heart attacks and strokes. But there's been no excess in cancer, heart attacks and strokes. So it's been a shift from hospitals to homes. Now, what, uh, the, 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 of course statistics are so infuriating because they reveal that and then they don't tell you what you want to know is, well, actually, is this a good thing or not? Because most people would prefer, I prefer to die at home, most people would prefer to die at home. More people are dying at home. But what's their end of life care like? Are they getting the Michael Miller nurses? Are they getting the walking pubs? Are they getting care of some of these people dying on their own? So there, I, it's something I feel very strongly personally about because of the personal experiences of how you know, a, a death at home can be as good as you, know, you could expect it to be. And so, I, I, something I feel very strong about this is an area that we need far better data on is end of life care. Because nobody collects it, the quality of end of life care. So, anyway, that's my little obsession, which um, some of you may also be interested in. Okay, so, um, here's some bullet points. Kind of PowerPoint, but that's some bullet points. Um, yeah, it's been a very busy time. I think, and I would say this, that the, the big organisations have done a really good job. You know, getting this data out. People have worked their what's it's off at home. Enormous amount of work. From the media, you may, have you may have noticed that there's been this pandemic thing, and that if you turn on the radio or the television, you'll get some scientists there, you know, going back, 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 and talking about stuff, you know, all the time. You cannot believe, if you are if vaguely scientific and can string three words together, the phone has been going the whole time, <laughs> saying, can you come on news tonight? Can you do this? Can you do World of One? Can you do this? Can you do GB News with Nigel Farage? <laughs> <laughs> that one I didn't do. <laughs> but, everything, but other things, you know, I have done quite a lot of it, but everybody does. Um, there's been, in, the behind the scenes, there's this thing called the Science Media Centre, which is an extraordinary organisation that puts um, journalists together with scientists. So as, if you want you on their books, I get all the um, government reports and the um, papers that are going to be released before publication, under embargo. You know, we're trusted not to talk about them. So we can get our quotes ready, we can read them, we can analyze them, we can criticize them, and the journalists can then use what we say. That's why when you see a, a newspaper report about, you know, something or other, there's all these quotes from the scientists, they saw them the day before. They didn't, you know, they, they got them early. They got them at the same time as the journalists did. Fantastic. And most journalists have acted really well. I've hardly been stitched up at all, which is crazy. <laughs> um, but the tr tricky thing, and I think that it's this business of, you know, you're being interviewed, and I say, you know, dinner with, with, with all the team. Um, the media thrive on conflict, on blame, and on speculation. So if you get up there, whatever the researcher has said they want to talk to you about, Nick Robinson will start asking you, but, well, you know, about well, you know, what should have been done, or what do you think is going to happen? And I don't want to talk about either of those. So I just I said, I'm not going to do that. Either. And I, 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 got it, I, got, I was on the Today program, and Nick Robinson, he got to an absurd degree, he kept on doing this. I said, no, I don't know, I don't know. So he said, what about Dominic Cummings? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, you know, Dominic just, just, just fell about laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and he said, my God, if everyone refused to answer these questions, we wouldn't have anyone to talk. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, but I did, I have learned, to make light of it, and just say, I don't know, because I was on many questions, and they asked me a question, I said, I haven't got a clue. Next, he asked somebody else, which I, which I think was a, a unique phenomenon. You know? <laughs> so, um, but we've done, um, you know, it's been very interesting, we've had a, um, you know, uh, 
column in the Observer every week since January on uh, 350 words, Anthony Masters and I. Very challenging. I mean, for those of you who write anything, trying to write something complicated in 350 words is difficult. I mean, I, my admiration of journalists is twice as difficult, more than twice as difficult to write on 700 words. So I mean, I spent the train ride coming down trying to write about a West Country issue, which is positive lateral flow test followed by a negative PCR. What does it mean? And trying to get that down to 350 words is difficult. Anyway, so that's been a real challenge, be quite fun. Um, now, the, the, but the, the point is that interpreting data is not easy. Uh, I, I, so I'm going to step back a bit and say, you know, what, what's the job of statistics? Well, there's some, there are some very young people in the audience. And that, because basically, that's why I like doing schools talks, I want to encourage people to get into stats and data science. I think it's unbelievably important and an honourable thing to do because we need people. You can't just collect data and it doesn't just offer up its secrets automatically. It doesn't tell you the truth. And Nate Silver, the guy who wrote Signal the Noise, really good quote. The numbers are no way speaking for themselves. We speak for them, we imbue them with meaning. It requires human intervention, human understanding, the knowledge about where the data comes from. Is that these aren't just you know numbers at all. They're not just computer code. It's not just a spreadsheet. We have to know who collected the data stuff and how did they collect it. We've got to know all that stuff. So for me, as a mathematician, as a mathematician, I've got absolutely full circle from only wanting to sort of do the maths to now having no interest in that. I mean, much more interested in what do these numbers actually mean? What are we counting? Does that mean? So here's some example. This is going to, be, going to get a bit tricky. A few tricky bits. Everyone got their heads, brains going, chime in, not too many drinks, I hope. Okay, so this came out a few weeks ago. <laughs> this was, I'm not going to explain this table to you. Basically, um, Public Health England now release um, cases and deaths by whether people have been vaccinated. Now, this is of huge interest to the anti vaxxer community. Now, if you look at this table in detail, look at this table. This is just next chapter I'll show you. So for age 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70, 70, I'm in that group there. Um, this is the number of cases of unvaccinated people, and this is the number of cases of fully vaccinated people. You may notice that overwhelmingly the cases of COVID now are in people who have been fully vaccinated. Now, that is absolutely, you know, meat and, and uh, drink to, to anti-vaxxers. Um, you know, that looks pretty odd, doesn't it? You know, if vaccination is so good, why is everybody, why are most of the cases, longer people, being vaccinated? Okay, does this mean vaccines don't work? No, it doesn't. But it's quite a subtle argument, because the point is that nearly all these people have been vaccinated. Vaccination isn't perfect, particularly about not stopping infection, 50 60 percent perhaps, in the effect of things that. So a lot of what are called breakthrough cases, people get and, and so, and those are the overwhelming number of cases. It's a bit like the analogy that you know, people have come up with, which I quite like, is it's a bit like most people who die in car accidents are wearing seatbelts. It doesn't mean seatbelts don't work, it's just that it means that nearly everyone wears a seatbelt and seatbelts aren't perfect. If everybody had been vaccinated, all the cases would have been among unvaccinated people. It doesn't mean they don't work. So, we should we. Back in June, the data on this came out about deaths, that most COVID deaths have been fully vaccinated. And we, we spotted that very early and got in an article early trying to explain why most people who now don't go for COVID vaccination don't think this is a bad sign. It's exactly what you would expect. Unfortunately, <laughs> if you just, uh, this headline without that bit got picked up by anti vaxxers circulating the world. We were accused of stoking vaccine hesitancy and suspicion by writing this article. And, um, and we got, I, I, <laughs> so, I don't know how many people on Twitter, but this is something you should have. has been on Anthony Masters and the entire line of genocidal editorial board of the Guardian to be hunted down and destroyed for crimes against humanity, period. So um, we thought, well, that's a bit strange. <laughs> I don't quite know. I don't even know what he was objecting to, but never mind. It's quite a harsh thing. And but we again, we Anthony was great. 
That seems harsh. I thought it was a good article. And I said, yeah, it seems a bit harsh, but I've had worse referees than <laughs> you know, so Which is an academic joke. And the, and the joke carried on. So we made light of it. Actually, though, this guy got reported and got banned from Twitter, as for, for threats. Because, that, you know, that's quite a serious threat, I suppose. But we're lucky. I'm an old white man, and I don't, I get a certain amount of abuse, but nothing in life as much as some other people do. So, you know, in a way, I'm privileged in that way, but I can, I, you know, I don't get as much abuse. And actually, on Twitter, you can block and mute people for no reason. So that was quite interesting. Um, and I was on, um, you know, Andrew Marr trying to explain all this stuff, why most people go. And then I got this one. I thought it was really unfair. Well done. You just put back people getting vaccinated by listening to that idiot David that's speaking of <laughs> Oh no, I'm trying to explain it. That's not fair. Anyway, you've got to, you know, there weren't vast numbers of reviews. So anyway, it's sort of what, what one has to expect. Now. Now it gets a lot more tricky, what happened a couple of weeks ago. Now remember the business, the explanation for the fact that most people, or most cases have been um, uh, vaccinated is because most people have been vaccinated. In other words, so it's, you've got to look at the denominator. But then, PHE released this graph, which looks at the denominator. Now this is the rates of cases per 100,000. Not just the numbers, but the rates per 100,000, which should adjust for the problem that I showed. But look, in above 40, the rates in the vaccinated group are higher than the rates in the non-vaccinated <laughs> God, the anti-vaxxers are mad about this. And me honestly, because this looks really bad. What's going on? Why are there more cases per 100,000? And uh, Peston, Peston's quite good. But when it comes to stats, he can be a complete ass. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is not, he's got previous on this as well. So he tweeted out this, he got picked up, he deleted it afterwards, but saying, oh, look at this, look at this, I found this. Oh my God. But it is quite subtle now, it can get really quite subtle. And okay, here's the point. And God, this is it. We don't know how many people are under the I mean, we really, really don't know how many. We don't know when the date of the new census comes out, we will know for a while. We, don't, we really don't know how many people we need. And um, so let's take people aged 40 to 49 in some of the audience. If you look at medical records, at GP records, and that's what's being used by Public Health England, they say there's 8.1 million in that age group in England. But it's a lot of double counting. People are registered with more than one practice. People have left the country and they're still on the list. But partly because the GP can kind of claim it. Anyway. So, uh, but the other one else estimate there's 7.1 million in that age group. There's a million difference, a huge difference. And that's from, but that's the numbers not right either. Because it's based on the 10 year old census with revisions for births and deaths, but we don't know how many migrants are there. We don't know how many people are coming back and stay in the country. We don't know. So, but we do know, and this is a good stat, there's 6.4 million being fully vaccinated. But the number left over, unvaccinated, it could be somewhere between 0.7 million and 1.7 million. Probably near of this. We don't know. And so, I mean, it's really embarrassing for a statistician to admit that we're so uncertain. And it makes a massive difference. If you use this denominator, it all looks fine. The rates in the unvaccinated are much higher than the rates of the vaccinated, which is, I think, a little bit true. So, it is a bit of an embarrassing statistical embarrassment. Because people kind of assume that we don't know how many people in the country, don't we? You know. So, um, and public health England are really at fault there for not highlighting this in the graphic, to produce a graphic that is so easily misinterpreted as a disaster. So we wrote another article about this, take care about this, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and that got, we got a certain amount of abuse for that as well. Anyway, never mind. Let's, um, let's just move on yeah. to um, a few, oh, this is some surprising facts and claims, because other books full of these things. Um, okay, first of all, I don't think it's that surprising, but I think we all know, but maybe not quite the, the degree to which this virus hates old people. God, it hates old people. Um, over the 90s, in the first wave, 35,000 times the death rate of school kids. You know, unbelievable. Um, you know, 2% um, of over 90s died. 
that are just extraordinary. We're very pleased with one in 600,000 of these guys. So it was quite extraordinary. Um, this is quite interesting, and, and this relates to the, um, you know, the daily number, you know, oh, how many people have died of you know, COVID, have been reported to die of COVID in the last 24 hours. This, <laughs> if you listen, these are Sunday's numbers over the whole pandemic, and this is Wednesday's numbers over the whole pandemic, which roughly are about twice Sunday's numbers. Sunday and Monday are always incredibly low because the deaths are new. Tuesday and Wednesday is already really high because it's taking up the stack. Thursday is just about believable or not. So only listen to this data on Thursdays. And then you might have a reasonable idea of what's going on. But the news media, some of them, the ones who don't, still will say, oh, look, this many people have died in the last 24 hours. We've known this for 18 months, since these numbers just got them down according to the daily news. And I wouldn't say, in the, are they, can you believe them? No, you can't believe these numbers on Wednesday or Sunday. But they're still useful, especially if you compare them with the same day of the previous week, or you do a seven day running average, or you do something with them. As long as you take them literally, they're useful, but they're not the truth. And trying to explain that to people who are not very numerous is quite difficult because people tend to say, you know, if people are not very numerous, they tend to either, you know, take the numbers as if it's some gospel truth or reject it completely. And what I'm saying throughout this is you can't rely on any of these numbers. They're okay, they can help, they're helpful, but none of them are right. None of them are right at all. But they're, you know, they're good enough to give us a lesson of what's going on. We can get a picture of that um, without trusting the numbers completely. Now, this is an interesting one. This pandemic has been a great thing for young people. It saved the lives of young people. Over 15 to 29 year olds, their death rate has dropped. Over there, over two, lower in 2020. It should have been fine. So that's that's the average number of deaths in 15 to 29 year olds in 2015-19, and that's 2020, and that includes the COVID deaths. So it's been a net lifesaver for young people. This pandemic, I think, you know, it'd be a really good thing if we kept the young people locked up the whole time, <laughs> <laughs> and then they wouldn't have these road accidents and these fights and get drunk. No, but actually, I did have to point out that's not what I mean, just in case I did. And you don't actually mean that. But I have been accused of saying that. As soon as I pointed out that this was a, you know, a net benefit for young people in terms of life saving, there's 300 fewer families mourning the loss of a young person. Of course, they don't know who they are. But the 115 families who have a young person die of COVID know exactly who they are. So that's the curious imbalance in terms of the life saved and the life lost. Lives, even though there's more lives saved than lost, only the lives lost know who they are. So, um, but as I said, it's not a good thing. And it's a huge reduction in road accidents and, and in violence. And actually, you know, although there's the, the counter, of course, big rise in mental illness and depression in younger people, no rise in suicide. A bit like the war, big rise in anxiety, no rise in suicide. So, um, but we'll see what happens in the future. So, uh, oh yes. You may have alcohol drunk staying roughly the same, but the distribution spread out <laughs> in, in the lockdown. People who didn't drink that much before tended to drink even less. People who drank a reason that before just piled in even more. <laughs> so the average stayed roughly the same, but the spread increased. And that means that the harm increased because it's, there were more harm done by the people who piled in than the ones who just, just stopped. So it's the interesting thing, again, what it shows from a statistical point of view is that averages are hopeless, God, I hate averages, because that, just, that loses the whole signal by saying, oh, my average hasn't changed that much. No, the whole pattern has changed. And the effect of it is more of a problem because the spread is different. So it's a really nice teaching example. Oh, this one. Oh, can I get this one? Actually, you, you can't see the yellow paper, but it doesn't matter that much. Why, is it, why did this country do so badly? This is an amazing paper that came out looking at, using genomic analysis, looking at how did the virus get into this country. Now, in other countries, it sort of erupted, it, it, it was very focused, you remember, around Bergamo and Milan and all this, big concentration in Paris and around Madrid and things like this. 
UK, the trouble with this damn country is that everyone travels so much. It didn't come in from China, it came from Spain and France and Italy in early March. People coming back from their holidays, not even half terms, after half terms, adults coming back from their holidays, skiing in particular, massive pile. There was also the Atletico Madrid uh, Liverpool game on March the 10th, right in the middle there. But that's where it really brought it in. And it brought, they brought them in right across the whole country, not just to London, everywhere. So you had over a thousand simultaneous outbreaks erupting around. And by that time, they'd stopped contact tracing, they weren't tracing, they weren't testing, completely hopeless, we were doomed from at that point. Because, and, and again, I'm not going to get the blame, but the select committee this week said, you know, there were no border controls, there was no contact tracing, there was no, no testing. We were, it was, the writing, we, you know, it was completely predictable at that point, if we'd known this, but we didn't know, because we were testing people, <laughs> yeah, that we were completely bugged. And, and you know uh, that led to this massive first wave. Okay, so it is extraordinary. And China was not in China; it all came from Europe. Um, oh yes, okay. For the skeptics, for your for your uncle Uncle Jim, who says that oh these people would have died anyway. People are just dying with COVID, not because of it. They you know within twenty, they just had a positive test and then they died of something else. Okay, no, no. Uh, on death certificates, about nine in ten which mention COVID. Have it as the underlying cause. These people died earlier. No, obviously, all anything does is bring them their fault because no one lives forever. They died earlier, and on average, the years of life lost 10 years of life. Um, well, again, that's an average, but it's a very misleading average because the most common amount of um, time that lost was, was less than a year. In the very large number of people in care homes, elderly, vulnerable, whose deaths, as we saw in the first graph, were just brought forward. By less than a year. That was the most common thing. But oh, I should have got a graph, you know, but it's a curve where it looks like that. <laughs> you know, the peak is there, but then it's got a long tail of people who are losing 10, 20, 30, 40 years of life. And on average, it's about 10. Oh, yeah, no more lethal. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is old. This is before vaccination. Yeah, COVID is about 10 times as dangerous as flu as you, if you catch it. Because people say, oh, it's only just like flu. No, it's not like flu. Actually, it might be a bit like flu now. Okay. If you're fully vaccinated and you get COVID, it's a lot less dangerous. So plausible, except that now the analysis seems to be that if you get flu and COVID, it doubles the risk. So it sort of adds, adds, adds up those two risks. So normally, flu, you reckon about one in a thousand people now will die if got flu, and it's probably down to near that now with COVID. But if you get both of them, they add up. So um, that's what I've got to say. Trust. Okay, now, I'll, I'll come to an end soon, um, because I'd like to answer questions. Oh, that's not too bad, yeah. Okay, I'd just like to talk more generally about trust and science and etc, etc, because this is so important. Now, I don't know if you know, Nora O'Neill did read lectures years ago on trust. I don't like TED Talks, but if you want to watch one TED Talk, what's this one? Nine minutes, TEDx Parlor and Nora O'Neill. She's wonderful, terrifying, she's a tiny little woman, completely frightened. Um, philosopher of Kant, and she, she, in nine minutes, she managed to get Kant and jokes and trust and what, you know, everything into it. She's just brilliant. She, and she, but she's a sort of jobbing, roll your sleeves up philosopher who kind of can produce sound bites, which is so useful. So here's number one sound bite, and we've got these. The first sound bite she says is that, you know, I, we get asked all the time, you know, how can we get people to trust us? We want to be trusted. Organizations, everyone wants to be trusted. And she says, that's not completely wrong. You know, none of us should be trying to be trusted. The duty upon us is to demonstrate trustworthiness. We should earn it. So this is duty ethics, as I'm never written in Kant, but never mind, I think that's what it's about. So this is turning the responsibility to the, essentially the authority figure, to demonstrate trustworthiness. It's such a powerful idea. It says, no, it's up to us. It's not up to us, to, it's not our job to try to persuade people to trust us. We just have to be trustworthy. It's a duty, it's an ethical duty. And she's had a huge influence just by this simple idea. Um, the code of practice, I don't recommend, unless you read something from insomnia, I don't <laughs> necessarily recommend, recommend this as, as reading. Um, but it's a great document, and it, it's turned out to be really powerful. This is a document of Larry's, 
the uh, Office of Statistics Regulation to publicly call out and criticize politicians, which they do regularly. And its number one pillar is trustworthiness and quality and value. But statistics should be trustworthy. The whole of our national statistics system is based on the idea of trustworthiness. It's a really powerful idea. So, um, and I, I won't show that, but I, I did a rant, a real rant, my one, one of my few rants on Andrew Marr a year ago, up in May, in which I had a real, I just watched a briefing the night before, which really pissed me off. It was a whole lot of just big numbers, this many people have been tested, they haven't just been posted out. It was just numbers being rattled off. So I said, this is number theatre. This is not trustworthy communication statistics. 1.7 million views, all that. So, you know, <laughs> my most successful bit of communication. So it just shows, if you rant on and criticise politicians, that's when you get the, um, that's when you get the views. But I didn't want to do that. But um, it, it, it is such an important idea. And we try to sort of, you know, like on these lists, everyone likes lists. Um, try to make a list of, if you want to be trustworthy, in almost anything you do, if you want to try to communicate about numbers and things like that, here's some things you might want to think about. The first is, you've got to decide, are you trying to persuade people, or are you trying to inform them? You know, are you trying, you know, sometimes you might want to persuade, you might be wanting to persuade them to get vaccinated, you might need to lose weight, to exercise more, and drink less, and not smoke. Yeah, fine, you might want to do that. But at least be honest, and say, what are you actually trying to do? And we believe that you should be trying to inform people, to um, raise the level of the discussion, leveling up the discussion, to um, you know to empower people to make better decisions on their behalf that fit with their values. You should be treating people with respect, um, and that means you have to be balanced about anything, climate change, anything. Who are the benefits of climate change? No, it doesn't mean they're equal. Not a false climate, but talk about. I mean, you know, we're going to have some wonderful wine. You know, come on, this. Let's, let's actually be balanced because then that is trustworthy. Um, but you've got to be upfront about uncertainties. And you've got to talk about how, whether, whether the evidence is any good or not. A whole lot of stuff coming out from SAGE today on, on face coverings in which they say about they got low confidence in some of the conclusions, high confidence in others. They're very good about that. Then um, this is the one what we try to do. There's this idea of pre bunking, so like or inoculation against misinformation. You might want to ask about misinformation. You know, how do you counter all this rubbish out there? And um, we try to do this pre-bunking, and others get in there first. Well, this is why most people who die have been vaccinated. I mean, it all went horribly wrong, but never mind. <laughs> and still believe it's the right thing to do, to try to get in there first. Um, now, I, the, our sort of peak of our influence, I think, on this was, I don't know if you, you watched this um, briefing on 7th of April, with John Van Tan, JBT, one of the most trusted communicators, explaining why the AstraZeneca vaccine was no longer going to be recommended for the under 30s. And we'd, we'd been sent the data, we'd produced some graphics, I spoke with him in the morning on the phone, going through the evidence, and we sent them some pictures, and we thought they might, you know, redraw them or something, and they used them on the screen. So they put up this graph, you know, he was talking to this, you know, live to a big audience, Important time, lots of attention. I was amazed. It's so complicated, but because he was so skilled and trusted, he went through this in great detail, and people really loved it. These these then went around the world. Everyone used them. So basically, what we're trying to do is to do this thing of bad. We aren't going to say vaccines are good or bad. We're going to say, okay, here's the harms for vaccines. These are these nasty blood clots, especially in the brain, that have been developed with AstraZeneca, and. This shows from different ages here in my game here that the risk goes up as you get younger. So that was the what the data was saying. Now the benefits, and we tried to choose, there are lots of benefits of vaccination, we tried to choose something that's basically similar, but obviously we chose not going into intensive care. And those go up massively as you get older. Huge increase in benefit as you get older, because the virus hates old people. So for people my age, in terms of the benefit-harm balance, well, it's a no-brainer. But look, as you get younger and younger, by the time you get down to 30, so it seemed to be a really good visualization to explain why they weren't going to be recommended for the under 30s, and then later changed it to the under 40s. So this went around the world, you know, it, um, it was, we translated it, it was copied by various places, and it was very popular indeed. And we revised it later a bit by 
everything you want isn't in the graph. Can, we, you know, can you put in the graph and isn't in the graph? Because actually, these are not all the problems. These are not all the benefits. And in, in particular, the benefit of getting vaccinated for the people around you isn't the benefit. You know, it's absolutely crucial for younger people. So we put in a section saying, you know, other possible benefits and problems are hard. So that was a real success. It was a lot of work, you know, that things um, my colleagues did. Okay, just for the shop now, but nor in the other. Okay, for those, th this is one really is supposed to be statisticians and people who communicate data. I said, she puts you great at saying bites. So she says, if you're going to be open and honest and trustworthy, you've got to make information accessible. It's got to be able to find it, not some massive PDF or something like that. You've got to, people are going to be able to find it really well on the whole world. Um, people are going to be able to understand it. There's no good baffling people with jargon. I mean, some of the stuff that comes out, I can't, I mean, they really struggle to understand. No, it's not, that's not acceptable. It's got to be usable. I love this. It's got to, it's got to answer people's concerns. Even if you don't think their concerns are that, are what you're concerned with, you have to listen. First rule of communication, shut up. Listen. Listen to your audiences. What are they concerned? What are they, what are they worried about? And then, you've got to be accessible, she says. Somebody should be able to check. Check your work. You can't just expect it to be taken on trust. You've got to allow people to drill down and find more. So I, I think we should have little banners, accessible, intelligible, usable, accessible. And I keep on ranting on to all my colleagues, you know, go through this checklist every time we're doing any communication. Okay, finish off that. I have your questions. Oh, usual stuff. Yeah. This is terribly, terribly important. <laughs> and, um, you know, as, as statisticians, we know, as the president of the Royal Statistical Society, we spent ages thinking about how can we get the public to understand the importance of statistics? And how can we get the politicians and the media to be interested in statistics? And then, we spent ages that, you know, we're trying to do campaigns. And then this virus comes along and does all the work for us. <laughs> yeah, suddenly, stats, and I hope, you know, we can see a Brian Cox effect on that, that this will lead to more younger people wanting to study data science and stats. Because they've seen that this is so important. We have a right to understand this. Okay, final, final point. Just warnings, anyone in front of the media, be careful. I've made every mistake ever. But I don't know if you count this one as a mistake or not, I think, or, or a success. Um, I was on the Today program last December, before Boris decided to come to cancel Christmas, and I said, raised voices could spread the virus. And I'm in a choir, and you know, I said, so well, maybe singing will be banned. And in fact, we, had to, uh, we, we did our carols outside, masked two meters apart. It was, it was right, you know, we still did it. And then I said, well, maybe a good idea then to ban family arguments. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, you know, around that Christmas table, you start shouting at each other, no ventilation, just the quickest way to spread the virus. <laughs> This was a joke. <laughs> However, by an hour later, in the Daily Express, Christmas <laughs> morning, there's a couple of fans who are arguing with the Red Coders, but they call for the leading minister of Yes! Yes! So I think this was actually a successful bit of communication, and it got me, I just made me laugh so much, I was so proud. Okay, I'm going to stop now, and thank you very much. <laughs>
the, the, the best way is to look at excess deaths, like the people who have died in hospitals and homes and things like that. Just look at how many people have died more than you expect. And then you get some. We topped the European League table in the first wave for excess deaths, which was worse in the whole of Europe. Um, because it was over the whole country, the areas in Europe would be a lot worse, but over the whole country we were the worst. However, since then, we sort of dropped down this league table. There's now none of the European countries who have done worse in terms of excess deaths, because I think we did very good vaccination, really vaccination growth. Well. Um, but then when you look at excess deaths in some countries, and the ones that are really shining on here are like Peru and Bolivia, South American countries, are unbelievably bad. They haven't, not, not if you count COVID deaths, but if you just look at how many more people have died than actually. And in mean, some places in India, we don't even know how many people have died. So it, it's, it's very difficult to tell. And, and, and that's why I'd argue against any sort of precise leak table, but it's still really useful to try to see. Try to understand that. But um, unfortunately, we are left with just counting the, 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 the deaths. Um, and then you should adjust for age and things like that. You can do all that stuff, and there are to do that. Um, but, I mean, then of course, the, as I said, all, all the only thing stats do is just generate more questions. Well, why? Yeah, what's the reason for these differences? And you start to make Sweden and Germany and so you can go on forever. And it's very difficult to say why. Except I was going to point out, we know one of the reasons is why we did so bad. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, can you tell us about statistics? Did you use a huge amount by government different quantity numbers at us uh, to support uh, the few targets? Where does one look? For the truth oh. in those numbers. Yeah. Um, but, are there any, dare I say, periodicals, newspapers, yeah. BBC, or uh, Fox News, or wherever one, where one may trust an interpretation of those yeah, numbers? That is such a good point. I mean, it really is. And, I'm, and, and that's what made me so fed up about the briefings, because it's just, you know, numbers. Because numbers are often, almost always used as rhetorical devices. They used to try to persuade you. That something is, is either reassuring or, 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 or frightening. Um, I, okay, I would say this would be right, but I do think not as national statistics. The agencies, the national agencies, are very good. And the ONS is specifically by law not under ministerial control. Um, about uh, 12 years ago, it was taken out of control of the Treasury and put, in, put under Parliament. So there's no minister controls you know, the official statistics in this country. That's really valuable. That's a very good thing. At the very end of other countries, end of this considerably. In terms of media outlets, I suppose I, I you know, I think yeah, the Financial Times and the uh, BBC, I think they're good. But they generally they've been very good the mainstream media on in terms of stuff. There's they're not even you know uh, Daily Mail, so if you want Telegraph, they're a bit iffy, but actually. I read their cover books, they've got a lot of interesting stuff. So the mainstream media have not been too bad on this at all. Um, the, the, the social media can be all over the place, absolutely everywhere, in terms of, you know, on all sides, you know, about um, the claims. Um, I mean, you, you, you know, you, certain newspapers where the Guardian will have a different view from the Telegraph, definitely. You, know, you have to take that into account. But I would like to be able to tell you more. Um, but I do think actually our national agencies, the BBC and the official stats, are not bad at all. But I don't trust what when politicians start using numbers, my you know, you know, skeptical, cynical antennae go straight up. As soon as they quote a number, I think I wonder if they even know what this means. And it's always always to make us try to make us feel something. It's not actually informing us. So it's this business of trying to inform rather this way, and you wonder. Try to read stuff that you feel. Because I always ask, if I hear a number, I don't even look at the number, I ask, why am I hearing this? Who's trying to persuade me? Has someone got it? Why has why someone chosen to show to tell me this? What are they trying to do? How are they trying to manipulate me? So I prefer to become very cynical on this. Um, think about, even before I start thinking whether I believe the number or not, I think about why I'm not being told this. Oh, there's I have a question about masks. Oh, it's just been so unknown 
Yeah. Yeah. So like where else and where else mm -hmm. now, where else and more. Um, so I was just interested in that. Masks are really, there's been a whole new sort of stuff coming out about masks, but actually to quantify the effect of masks is very difficult to do. You can't do it exactly. Whereas there may be vaccines or treatments where we know pretty well exactly what the benefits are um, because we can do proper experiments. But the, um, and, and collect, you know, reliable data, we know where the sort of thing that's in. Masks, are people wearing them, how they're wearing them, in what context, what's their so it's unbelievably difficult. So, but then I think there's a, you know, um, an acceptance that masks are useful as part of the general, general, um, you know, measures against the virus. And I, I, I suspect in the winter that there will be a, the, the libertarian approach that the government's taken since July may have to be revised. The rest of Europe is very much more stringent, and they've got much lower rates than we. So, um, but masks are tricky because we, you know, how would you find out? Incredibly difficult. Scientifically, it's incredibly difficult to do. We do laboratory experiments in Africa. So it's, it's one of these sort of areas. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yes. I'm quite before the pandemic, I listened to a lecture of Gresham, the professor Witten, and he was saying, you know, this is coming, you know, we need to prepare ourselves. Yeah. Um, and some stood up with you and say, well, modern science. Um, are we just unlucky that this pandemic has happened and we've had such a gap since the previous pandemic? No, I, don't. I mean, Chris was very good. I mean, he's, he's really still very thought about these things, and I think he's, he's excellent. No, I think, um, I don't think we have been unlucky. You know, it was, it was, you know, now it was a you know, years and then before. But I think um, sometimes this was going to happen. And that's why I think quite rightly there's a lot of attention now to the risk. You know, the resilience planning in this country. I mean, there was a plan for a big pandemic, but it was a flu pandemic. And the emergence of emerging virus, you know, when these sort of things start as the MERS, that all happened somewhere else. And all these people want to know their remarks, and oh, well, we don't do that. And in fact, totally changed. So, no, I don't, I think there was, it's easy to say now this was predictable, but it was predicted that <laughs> something like this was going to Over, over longer period, 
economic periods. No, I, I think that's why we have to try to communicate both, you know, averages and variability. The, to do one without the other is not appropriate. You know, really, I would have seen the whole distribution to show distributions all the time, but you've got an idea of, of the spread. Otherwise, an average can be very misleading. Um, and uh, is it the... Um, oh yeah, yeah, for example, the interesting one in the book, you know, the first, when the virus, the R was, is three for the wild type virus. So on average, somebody, if you got the virus, the original virus, so it's a totally susceptible population, on average, three people infected. Most people don't infect anyone at all. So the huge, 80% of infections are from 10% so it's a, it's a, a the distribution of the number of people infected is on average of three, but a huge spike on zero because it's got a great long tail that goes in from you know, some people who infect 10, 20 people. So this is very unintuitive because it, so these are not nice distributions with nice little bell shaped things with an average of nice spread. These are curves like this. As I said, like the number of years lost from COVID, the most, li the most likely value is very little at all. <laughs> the average is 10 years. So these are very difficult things to communicate. But I think we've got to try, because otherwise people will get the wrong idea from an average. Oh, the other misleading average is that COVID, um, uh, if you get COVID, it's a 1% chance of death. Almost nobody has got a 1% chance of death. Actually, I think back in my age, it was a 1% chance of death. You've either got unbelievably low than that, or hugely high <laughs> You know, it's, it's, a, it's a statistic that represents almost nobody. It's an average that represents very few people. So, I, this is different. I mean, how do you do it? I mean, it's, it is really tricky stuff. But it, again, actually, the interesting thing is that people are realizing it's a lot more like um, big move now um, to rather than quoting average GDP, to look at regional GDP, to get things right down to the local level. Huge move because people think that would just be going on average, this is better, this would be better. Oh, yeah. uh, I knew it might not be at all. And so variability is unbelievably important. And because people like looking, you know, if you start if you start with maps and showing things changing and what things are locally, everyone loves that quite a lot. I mean, it's really coming back to, to the infection rate, actually. One of the things that always sort of puzzled me was when we ever got to population density in the sense that, oh, yeah. um, you know, I, I get friends who say, well, you know, we've got the same population in Germany as you have in the UK, and we've got nearly as bad as you. And some of it, you sort of think, well, they've got more land and space yeah, and yeah, yeah. accommodations yeah. and things. And I wonder, you know, I think for us, actually, we're heavily populated. Yeah. And we live, you know, there's not a lot of, of space no. between towns and no. villages and big cities. No. And how much do you think that oh, very had important. an impact? No, you could say, you know, we, 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 the odds are really stacked against us. Apart from the political errors that we made, yeah. um, the odds are really stacked against us because we are a country that travels hugely, and everyone in our country travels, goes abroad, um, that we're very densely populated. We've got a very, you know, we have a large, a big, you know, section of the population living in overcrowded housing with multi-generational occupancy, and so the, uh, the growth of the virus within um, ethnic communities very much, you know, determined by those by those factors, and so and and, and we're overweight. So all these things have they been documented? Though have you done the statistics? On well, they, 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 I know, yeah, and has anyone tried to say separate out? The effect of all those factors. They have done things like looking at the effect of, you know, the increased risk of ethnicity. If you allow for all these factors, it almost disappears. It's not genetic, mm -hmm. and, um, and 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 then if you allow for occupation as well, you can go. These are these are environmental factors that led to certain parts of the population doing really badly. And actually, more than pre existing conditions. So, although, you know, I did mention obesity, that's not anything like as important as how many people you mix with during the day and how close you are, and whether it's multi generational or not. So, it's all that stuff which is structural. That's, and that's, you know, the virus gets into a community like that and thinks, whoopee, you know, off we go. Whereas in Sweden, 
They didn't have to have all these rules because nobody speaks to each other anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they all live alone. And, and that's the Prime Minister said, we are a socially distanced population. We need to be the virus so instead, you know, instead they, they, didn't have, they didn't have rules because they were, you know, they sort of exercising this um, the separation. I'm intrigued by the geography of this pandemic. You've touched upon the European uh, experience. I wondered across our, our country, the United Kingdom, the regional variations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's very strong, very strong. We're in the southwest. Um, and just the latest data suggests that there has been no excess mortality in the southwest up to now. But um, the people who have died are with Sweet Peaks, deaths in the southwest, but um, very much larger people bringing deaths forward among vulnerable population who deaths have been brought forward who would have died fairly soon afterwards. And so, compared with other parts of the country, the southwest has not seen any excess mortality. And that, by now, at times there were, but it's dropped away um, up to, uh, you know, through that whole thing. So, w which is, you know, extraordinary and very different from other parts. So that I think big regional variation. That's new data this morning. How soon can you benefit from the 2020 census? Oh, that's a really good point. The 2021 census, um, yeah, because it, I mean the other thing is that it was done in odd situations. So they're trying to get the, the answer that as quickly as possible, but it's going to require constant revision because, you know, how many people were living in second homes in the West Country because of the pandemic during the, um, you know, during the census and it had been done in other time. They wouldn't have been here, they'd been somewhere else. Students who were not at university. So the census was done at a rather unusual time. It would be useful, you know, I shouldn't have this, when they're going to start getting population for example. Then we might find you know how many people are in the country. But then again, we're in quite a flexible time because of Brexit and movement to the EU and the country. So I think even when the census results are out, it's going to require they're, there's they're going to have to be um, there will be systems for making fairly much better, quicker revisions of it, with much better data. Um, we, the, the, we've never we've never known how many people have are migrating in the United country. We know how many passenger movements there are, but we don't know how many people have on people stay. And so <clears throat> that, and then apart from this rather bad passenger survey stuff that's been done. So they, there's a move towards using administrative data more, which I think probably people assume is going to be used in the past. But actually work out how many people there are moving the country. Because there's a children we don't know. I mean, I was amazed at the this. So I, 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 I should perhaps know when it's going to start coming online. Um, a lot more than it has in the past because the census was almost completely online. But it's still it's only a snapshot and it'll be changed rapidly. Thank you. Sure. I know it's a good point. I mean, because, and that's one of the you know, criticisms is you know, we don't know. These are new, you know, new compounds, new vaccines. We, are, we clearly don't know the primary effectiveness. That is the same for most drugs that come on the market. There's always what's called post marketing surveillance that drugs are approved and then they're monitored to see whether there are unforeseen long term side effects. So that is an essential part. These the vaccines do seem. Extraordinarily so, considering that we've been given such vast numbers of people, um, including many vulnerable people. So they they do seem extraordinarily so. But because something might happen, I think it's very unlikely indeed. And the the benefits are obviously huge. So in a way there are un unknowns, of course. I, I think all 
the evidence is that there's no evidence of of the advantage of the They can't be. They can't be, yeah, they can't be. Yeah, no, and that will be being monitored the whole time. Yeah, no, absolutely. But there's no reason to think that they'll be there any more than there are for other, for, you know, yeah, for other drugs and medicine and treatments that we have to take. How would there be more recorded adverse reactions? Well, it's huge. Now, I mean, if you think of the yellow card system, yeah, I mean, we've given it, these things to 50 million people. Um, yeah, there's vast numbers of people recording results, you know, pregnancy and all sorts of things being recorded. But, but, and, you know, the serious ones would have been, would have been followed up. So, you know, there have been a lot of obviously, short term reactions. You know, you know that's going to happen. Um, but I, I, you know, in a way, there's, you've got to have some trust in the system that it is looking at these things. There is no other accepted system for monitoring adverse reactions. Um, and that there have, of course, been you know, things that have been picked up in terms of the myocarditis, the Pfizer, the, the, the blood clots for the, um, for the um, AstraZeneca, which is unfortunate, unfortunately very rare. So, um, you know, I can't, nobody no can say, oh, we're never going to find anything wrong with that. That's impossible to say. We can definitely say that it's saved you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of lives. And so I think that for me that risk benefit uh, balance has already been shown. Tell them the numbers to your blue in the face and look at the numbers. So, no, I think that what I regard, I, I, so I'm not on the side that, oh, we just need to tell people about this, and then they'll say, thank you very much, thank you very much. Now I will go and get vaccinated and wear my mask and do all the right things. No, no, they won't. So, and we know that, that actually information on its own is not changing the whole of the So we know that that's, and that's not what I'm trying to do. Yeah? I'm not trying to change I've just said that. <laughs> so that's my let out. So I looked at, but, so I would say, you know, like, oh, well, of course, there's a duty to do it. It's, you, know, you should provide people with good information so they can make up their own mind. If they want to ignore it, well, you know, that's their own way of production. But it should be there for people who really want to. And that there is, um, you know, it is part of a general, I don't know, improvement of the discourse about the bad stuff. Because without it, what have you got? People shouting. This at least provides something that should provide some stuff that at least this should not be argued about. You can know, argue about everything else, at least keep clear of this because we do know that it's going to be So that's what I do. We won't resolve arguments, I won't change the behavior of um, And, uh, oh yeah, I mean, it's a bit like even you know, personal things. It's like, you know, if you're getting a, you know, seeing a doctor and trying to make a decision and they tell you what your options are and what that would be bad. Have to do that. And all that information is not, might not change your mind, but you've got a right to see it, and it should be evidence is that it improves afterwards, even if things go wrong, people at least felt they made an informed choice, that they would have felt that they were given the information they wanted, even if they can not do it, and most people don't. <laughs> I mean, including me, I don't know about you, know, me, I know that if I you know, try and make a difficult decision, I've just written that my our observer article finishes it by saying that I just don't see the point of a confirmatory PCR after a positive back and forth. It just seems to keep most of the time. So why do why why would you recommend it? Because it's not strong enough to overwhelm the if you have a positive enough back and forth, a negative PCR. The evidence is still in favour that you've got it. So I mean, we reckon it's about 50 50 that you recommend it, and that seems enough that you should separate yourself from it. So, since the, if the test PCR doesn't affect your decision, <laughs> why are you doing it? So, I have no idea where this decision came that you should have confirmed through PCR or positive in that. 
the false positive rate of that is fairly low. So if you get a positive back, like, particularly when there's a lot of virus around, I mean, you should just step in and take yourself out. So I, I, I don't know why I keep doing that with my skin. So, yeah. So, you know, there is this laboratory that's playing like that, but it's nothing to do with the laboratory that, but that's not the point. Even without that laboratory, even the laboratory is fine, the, the confirmatory PCR seems to be the waste of time. But I, I don't know, I hope I'm not aware. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke about regional differences. You, you oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and how strong is the evidence that there's a correlation with um, deprivation? Oh, pretty good. But it's quite difficult to separate that from overcrowding. And I mean, in a way, deprivation on its own is just a label for the important things which are to do with the amount of close contact you have with. I mean, that is the deciding thing. How many people close contact you have? Because the virus spreads through close contact. So, I, mean, I think if you were deprived and you lived on your own in the middle of nowhere, that probably wouldn't increase your rates. But deprivation is so strongly linked with, you know, with multi generational housing, overcrowding, and the wrong occupations as well. You know, the, the, and, and occupations in which you have a lot of face to face contact. So, it's quite difficult. Deprivation on its own would probably, I would guess, is not in a way the causal factor, but it's so strongly linked with the really important factors. This is just how many people you see every day close to you. That's what that's what really drives everything. And that's why there's a huge difference between people staying at home and going to work. And that's why probably my, my guess is that this winter we'll be told to work at home. Because that, that is the big difference that decides how many people you come in close to. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting comment. Okay. Oh. It's an interesting comment because we're going back to the office next week. Oh really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, possibly not for the whole winter. Maybe not very long, but it's good. Um, what I was going to ask you about is, um, one of the things that drove me mad was when um, the reported that the R number that come down below one. Yes. So we can start doing everything again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but of course, ignoring the fact that the reason the R number had come down was because we weren't doing anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, do we do enough in communicating causality with statistics? Oh, that's a good point. Well, I just tried to do it. I mean, it, it, is, it is tricky because, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, somebody made the analogy, unlike, you know, you know weather, you know, they said, oh, you know, this is as if, um, you know, telling people to carry an umbrella makes it less likely to rain. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have in the mess office, but, but, people, but, but COVID is like that, is that what you say to people influences their behaviour and changes what happens. And in the end, it's behaviour that drives everything. You can have rules, you can have, you can do, you know, you can have regulations, you can have advice. That in itself does absolutely nothing. It's only to the extent that it changes behaviour and how many people we come close to. That is the absolutely deciding factor because that's how you spread it by coming close to people. You don't get lots of services and stuff like that. It's about getting, getting up close to people. So that's, in a sense, that's the only thing that matters. And everything else is only causal to the extent that it influences that. Uh, and we'll draw it to the close there. So, David, can you uh, sign some books? Oh, yeah. Um, David, just such a big thanks for, for shining such a bright light on, on the issues surrounding, the stats surrounding COVID. It's been fascinating. The questions alone, I think, were quite, were fantastic talk. Yeah. So, I think we should show our appreciation. Yeah.